punch over there as well. And we'll get done by the line. Yeah. Um, my, my luggage is at the hotel, but it's right next to us. It's kind of big. Is it the restaurant? Okay. <coughs> My time space yeah. looks crooked. Yeah. Where? It's all set up for you. The timing is here. Okay, great. Is that going to work with that one? Is that going to work well? Yeah, it should. Whichever you prefer, James. What? Whichever you prefer. I need to be up here so I can see it. Oh, I can see it. I can see it. Yeah, so if you need to read them, you can go here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, no. Just turn it here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's okay. Okay. Do the intros after you do the high. You want to start? Yeah, yeah. Because that'd be good. All right. So, good morning. For anyone who doesn't know me, I'm Professor Steve Schooner. And it is my privilege to welcome you on behalf, first of all, of my colleagues, including Professor Chris Eukins, Professor Joshua Schwartz, Professor Dan Gordon, uh, Professor Jessica Tilletman will be with us soon, and of course, on behalf of the George Washington University Law School and the American Bar Association Section on Public Contract Law International Procurement Committee. I don't know about you, but it was worth it just for me to come to a place where I could watch someone take a group picture with someone who's in another country. I thought that was fun. <laughs> and I hope the picture comes out. In any event, uh, the topic is a fascinating one. As many of you know, the faculty at the George Washington University Law School have been working with the World Trade Organization and many countries for many years on issues related to the government procurement agreement. But of course, the BRICS community is you might say either an alternative or an important voice whose role in the evolution of this agreement is becoming increasingly significant. Some of us think, and you may agree or disagree, that the government procurement agreement may represent the most significant harmonization of public procurement in the history of the world. Others, of course, can disagree, and I'm sure that'll be one of the things that we'll talk about today. But we have a very, very thin <coughs> schedule, as you will see. Um, just a couple things before we start. If on the way out you have the opportunity to thank the young lady in the red hair for organizing everything, that's Jessie Pierce. And if you liked your donut or your coffee, be sure to thank her. And then, of course, otherwise, I just want to turn it over and thank my colleague Chris Hugens for organizing this. And thank you all for participating. I'm sure we have a lot to learn today. Thanks for coming. Thank you. So welcome. I'm Chris Hugens, and uh, this program was originally conceived but when Cesar Pereira and I met in uh, New York, and then we met in Brasilia to talk about a good way forward um, on the GPA, potentially for Brazil. We actually had an opportunity to meet with officials from the farm ministry in Brasilia to talk about potential issues in Brazil and other developing nations joining the GPA. We thought it would be a good idea to have this colloquium, both to talk about Brazil and then more broadly to talk about other developing nations and how they might join the government procurement agreement, which is, an, as you'll hear, is an absolutely essential way forward uh, for bringing best practices in procurement to countries around the world. Our first speaker is going to be Rob Anderson, who's over here. Um, and Rob is a counselor at the World Trade Organization. Uh, he's located in Geneva. We're very glad that he could join us this morning uh, by, by video conference. He um, the, takes the lead in the secretary in dealing with issues of the government procurement agreement. He also, uh, deal, he also does regular training <coughs> around the world as part of the work of the WTO in training and best practices in procurement. Uh, he's published several books. He's published extensively articles as well. Uh, he is really a leader in understanding how the trade mechanisms, the international trade mechanisms, 
can be used to make the to make procurement work better around the world. He and I debate this a great deal but I my personal belief is that his work is profoundly important because eventually I believe the GPA will be the pathway to bringing procurement systems together around the world reducing trade batter reducing trade barriers but most importantly in the long term making procurement work better in each of the member states. Our second speaker is going to be Gene Holloman Greer. Gene has more than 25 years of experience in international trade as a US trade negotiator as a lawyer and as an advisor. She was instrumental in negotiating the current government procurement agreement. The text of the current government procurement agreement was finalized in 2007. It was finally approved earlier this year. Gene has been a very important person a pivotal person in improving the government procurement agreement and working on other free trade agreements that involve procurement around the world on behalf of the US trade representative where she was for many years. She's probably one of the world's leading experts in this area and she has a blog. I encourage you to follow her blog as well. It's an excellent blog on the trade issues in procurement. Our third speaker is going to be Johannes Schnitzer who's a Viennese lawyer who has an incredibly interesting practice. Johannes was here a few years ago visiting and he now represents nations that are actually joining the government procurement agreement. So he'll be speaking about the practical experience of nations joining the GPA. Johannes and I first got to know each other when he worked on the UN model procurement law and now he and I are working together on a training program in anti-corruption and for UNOPS, the UN agency. So he's got for the young lawyers in the room, Johannes is by far the most interesting practice that you can imagine. He's representing nations that are joining the GPA and he's working on anti-corruption issues around the world. He's a very good person to get to know. Cesar Pereira will be our fourth speaker. He's a named partner in the Brazilian law firm Justin Pereira. He works both on public procurement issues and other administrative law issues. He teaches on administrative law. He's taught at and he's attended universities both in Brazil and here in the United States. He was a visiting scholar at Columbia University on dealing with arbitration issues. Cesar really proves that it is possible for forward-looking practitioners to serve in a very important role in drawing together our international network of folks who are interested and committed to making procurement work better around the world. Last but not least, Mauricio Ribeiro is going to be joining us and he's going to be talking about PPP issues and how they're unfolding in Brazil. He is a private practitioner at Portugal Ribeiro Abogados. I think I got the Portuguese correct. If I missed that, I apologize. He focuses on public-private partnerships. For those of you who are sort of new to procurement, what's happening today in the national elections here in the United States will be profoundly important in the coming years in terms of public-private partnerships. Public-private partnerships are privately funded infrastructure projects where private capital provides, where private parties provide the capital for a public project. Other nations use these very aggressively and he's going to be talking about Brazil's experience. We in the United States are likely to use them more in the coming years because of the budgetary constraints that may come with a shift if, in fact, the Republicans take the Senate today and the Congress is controlled by Republicans. We're likely to see more public-private partnerships in the coming years for the young lawyers in the room. What Mauricio does is incredibly important to understand because it will become part of our practice here in the United States as well. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Rob Anderson. Rob, I'm going to, with your permission, I'll stand here and I will guide the slides through for you. If you just instruct me next slide, we should work just fine. That would be fantastic. So thank you very much, Chris, and it's wonderful to be here with everybody, at least virtually. And I'm just going to, I know I only have 10 minutes, so I'm just going to dive right in. And I'm really going to, and so I'm now on my first substantive slide. It starts, what is the GPA? I promise to go very quickly through the first seven slides, which are review for most of the people in the room, but just to make sure everyone's on the same page, and then I'll really uh, try to do my substance on the last three slides. So just to recall, in case people are forget, have forgotten about the GPA, you know, this is the preeminent international agreement. It's a plurilateral agreement in the WTO. It's, um, it is very much concerned with access to markets, but it's also concerned with good governance and promoting improved value for money and participating members' procurements. Uh, people join the GPA for many different reasons. Some do it for market access. Some do it uh, for the signal of good governance and the commitment to gov good governance. 
that it brings. And just to recall also at the bottom of the page, uh, the GPA is now well aligned with the UNSEED trial model law and procurement. And uh, I think you, some of you will know that also there's going to be a closer synergy now with the World Bank guidelines as well. So I'm now on my next slide. And again, this is truly review for most of you. Uh, but uh, just to recall what is in the GPA, general rules on non-discrimination, uh, national treatment and transparency. And these apply to what are called covered procurements. And uh, indeed, those are possibly the two most important words in the GPA. The coverage is defined in meticulously uh, in the schedules to the agreement. And just as a kind of um, parent to open a bracket, um, I would say that there is scope in, in the coverage details that are written into the agreement for each participating country. There is actually significant scope for implementation of social policy considerations, um, even, even uh, to a degree economic preferences, if we take account of uh, the ability to specify procurements that are not covered by the agreement or uh, to, for example, reference uh, set-asides for SMEs, as the United States does, and, and so forth. So the GPA also, of course, contains minimum standards on procedural aspects of procurement. This is not just for the sake of regulation for its own sake. It's really to ensure and to give effect to the principles of non-discrimination and transparency, which are at the core of the agreement. So I'm now on my next slide, uh, Chris. It's, it's uh, a continuation of the five main elements. And just to recall again, uh, the GPA requires each participating country to implement an independent domestic review system. Or these are, of course, go by many names, bid challenge systems, remedy systems, and so forth. But they're, they're really the same idea. And it does have minimum standards for each participating country's uh, domestic review system. The, the GPA is also subject to the WTO dispute settlement system. And uh, in my opinion, that is a, an important uh, aspect of the agreement, which is really what makes it an enforceable international treaty. We also have transitional measures for developing countries that come into the agreement. Uh, this is something we can come back to if we wish. But that is indeed something that might be relevant to uh, BRIC accession in the future. Okay, I'm now on my first slide about the, G the GPA renegotiation. And this is just uh, quickly, so this is slide number five in the lower right-hand corner. Uh, just to quickly recall that the revised GPA is now in effect and um, is, uh, this, this includes the modernized text of the agreement, which uh, in very significant measure was uh, written by Jean Greer, I, hopefully with a little bit of help from the Secretariat. Um, it includes a market access enhancement package. Uh, and there's also something called the future work programs, or rather the agreed work programs uh, of the committee, which were another outcome of the renegotiation. And these deal with issues like SME participation in procurements. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of meat here for the future. So my next slide just coming, so this is key improvements in the revised GPA text. And just to very quickly point out, the whole text has been streamlined and modernized. The uh, now properly reflects, of course, the electronic tools, which are very significant in Brazil. I, we're aware of this. Additional flexibility is now built into the agreement. Next slide. There's also more explicit, uh, so I'm on my next slide now, Chris. There's also now more explicit recognition of the GPA's significance for good governance and the fight against corruption. Um, this, is, this is actually a first for the WTO to, inclu to include explicit reference to the idea of anti-corruption as one of the goals of a WTO agreement. And as I said, there are improved uh, transitional measures for developing countries to join. Now, I'm now on my slide called the accession process. This is slide number eight in the lower right-hand corner. So the point here is that GPA accession is open to all WTO members. And obviously that includes all of the BRICS economies. And the, there are two main things, really, that need to be settled 
in any GPA accession. And the first is the, really the terms of coverage, that is the extent to which each participating economy's uh, procurements will be covered by the agreement. Because no country covers all of its procurements. Indeed, all excludes significant portions of their procurements. And it's really all about defining which procurements an individual country feels, feels comfortable uh, setting out for international competition and which ones it doesn't. And th important things like thresholds come into play. So the point I'm making is that actually uh, for any country that wants to join, there is significant scope to negotiate the terms of accession so that some procurements will be excluded, uh, others can be subject to potentially to price preferences and so forth if that is negotiated. All these possibilities are there. And the second thing that must be true in any GPA negotiation is that the party must put in place GPA compliant national legislation. So now on my second from last, my penultimate slide, who is in the agreement now and who is coming in? You see the details there. So right now at this moment, we have 43 WTO members that are covered by the agreement. Uh, 28 of those are European member states. But you also see you know, many other countries now. It, it's definitely well beyond now the, the traditional developed countries of the old days that are in this agreement. Now, point number two, I'm extremely excited about this. Just last week, literally, the committee agreed to the terms of accession for two more members. These are Montenegro and New Zealand, so they will now join, and that will bring to uh, 45, the total number of countries that have come into this agreement. Um, I have a movie of this on the WTO website. Chris can give you the details. Next so, uh, and <laughs> thank you. And currently, uh, so currently, then you see the list on my third bullet on this slide of, the, of the, those that have formally started the accession process. And I've underlined the ones that are most engaged in that process right now, and those are China, Moldova, and Ukraine. And, uh, you know, and so obviously you've got one of the, a very important grid right there. You also, uh, Russia has a commitment to seek accession, which will come into effect in about two years from now. So now I switch to my next and last slide, Chris. So this is on observership in the agreement. So uh, this is something that, uh, you know, I encourage all WTO members to consider. Actually, observership is costless and involves no obligations, no liabilities. Any WTO member can become a GPA observer. All you have to do is to write a letter to the committee. Uh, this is, uh, is completely easy. And a request for observership, a simple request for observership, does not imply a commitment to eventually become a party to the agreement. A particular country might have made such a commitment. Indeed, for example, China did and Russia did when they joined the WTO, but that's a different story. What that means is that when they joined the World Trade Organization, at that time they made a commitment also to seek accession to the GPA. And so China and Russia have done that. Uh, the other BRICS economies have not. And you see there the list of current observers under the agreement, and uh, indeed China, India, and Russia are observers under the agreement. Um, I'm sad to say Brazil is not. I hope they will be one day. And South, South Africa as well. But anyway, uh, if I can give an overall message uh, to conclude, I just would like to say um, I, the future of the GPA lies with the developing and emerging and transition economies. And uh, this is going to happen. And it's, you know, it certainly is taking a little longer to happen than some people might like. And I occasionally uh, wish it would go faster myself, but these things actually just have to follow their own course. And uh, Johannes knows and uh, has seen 
that you know Montenegro's accession was concluded in basically a year. Uh, um, New Zealand's in just about basically two years. So these things can happen, and they can actually happen reasonably quickly when there's a will. So this, this is uh, the future is all before us, and uh, I look forward to the presentations by my fellow panelists. And thanks very much for having me on this panel. Thank you, Robin. I just, I just for the for the audience, and we and the the Brazilian American Chamber of Commerce was very kind and helped us help support the the publication, the publicizing of this event. So it, this the the point regarding observer status is very important. And when we were having discussions in Brasilia, really the question was for Brazil: join the GPA or not join the GPA? Joining the GPA has very significant political ramifications in Brazil. There, the observer status is a, is a middle ground. It, as, as Rob outlined, there is no obligation that goes with being an observer. But as Johannes will be discussing in his presentation, by being, observer, by being an observer, a member of the GPA, and Brazil has met, been a member of the, G, of the, excuse me, by being an observer, a member of the WTO, the parent organization. And Brazil has been a member of the WTO. Brazil joined the GATT in 1948. So Brazil is a longstanding member of what eventually became the WTO. Brazil, by becoming an observer, would basically have a chair in the room to better understand how the GPA process unfolds and then better be able to address some of the flexibilities that Rob was alluding to earlier in his presentation. I'm sure that both Gene and Johannes will be discussing that in more detail. Gene? Um, thanks, Chris. Oh. Hi, Dean. Hi, Rob. How are you? <laughs> Good to share the podium with you again. Um, but I, I'm going to talk a little bit of, from the perspective of the BRICS. Um, and this is Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. And these are probably the five most important countries that are not yet in the GPA. And I'm going to just touch on their relationship to the GPA and then talk about some of the constraints for each of them, focusing mostly on Brazil. And then look at U.S. policy um, relating to the BRICS and the GPA. Um, first, just to pick up so a comment Rob made, um, of the BRICS, we have two of those, who, two of them have commitments to join the GPA, China and Russia. China started in 2007. We're into year seven. They're about to offer, make their sixth offer, but they're not there yet. So if if we saw Montenegro do it within a year and New Zealand within two years, China's on the way on the other end in terms of length of, of accession um, negotiations. Russia has a commitment to start in 2016. Now, both of these, just to, this is a point I think important with regard to Brazil. Uh, China and Russia, when they joined the WTO, were encouraged, pressured, um, however you want to term it, by the other... U.S. and other WTO members to commit to join the GPA. But as Chris just noted, Brazil is an original member of the GATT, so the U.S. never had that opportunity because it was always uh, a WTO member, or a GATT member and then a WTO member. Now, as uh, just to touch on the BRICS, three of them have observer status, China, Russia, and India. Brazil does not, nor does South Africa. Um, Brazil, from what I can, I, I don't think they've ever taken any or implemented any international agreements that have procurement commitments. They're a member of Mercosur, and there's a, Mercosur has a 2006 protocol on procurement, but it's not been, yet been implemented. Brazil is negotiating with the EU or with Mercosur. Brazil, as part of Mercosur, is, is negotiating with the EU on a free trade agreement, um, but that also has not moved forward very fast. And I assume that if it ever does, they're going to have to have some procurement commitments in that. Um, the U.S. has engaged with Brazil in the past on, on um, procurement in the free trade agreement of the Americas, which was an agreement that encompassed most of Latin America and was, uh, would have had a very strong procurement chapter had it concluded, but it, it, it did not conclude about a, about a decade ago. But what was interesting when we were negotiating with Brazil at that point in the, F in the, uh, on the procurement chapter, the U.S. and Brazil found that we could work really closely together because we had the same outlook in terms of what a procurement rule should look like. 
where the negotiations on procurement as part of this free trade agreement with the Americas fell down with regard to procurement was on market access because this was when President Lula came in and they never quite got to the point of tabling an offer on procurement. Unfortunately, Brazil has recently indicated, actually last year in their WTO trade policy review, that they have no plans to join the GPA. And so the question is going to be what can be done to encourage them to change that stance. Now, Brazil has made their, has a more complicated situation now in terms of joining the GPA because it has preference policies in place. And these were adopted, and I won't go into much detail because we have experts on those issues who will follow me. But once a country puts in place domestic preferences as a permanent part of their procurement regime, it makes it much more difficult for them to negotiate accession. And the U.S. certainly has a strong history of our own Buy American requirements, which we now have to, when we negotiate agreements, kind of weave our commitments amongst the preferences because some preferences you can waive and some preferences you have to exclude the procurement from the agreement. And that's a difficult situation. And I think that's probably one reason Brazil is now saying we're not, we have no interest in joining the GPA because we do have these permanent policies. You know, their recent election, it will be interesting to see whether President Rousseff actually makes any changes in their procurement policy. The sense had been that she was probably less likely to make changes in terms of more opening up their, more liberalization than her opponent was. But we'll see now how that actually unfolds. There might be a small window of opportunity there. Looking really quickly at India, they don't have any overarching government procurement policy. They are an observer to the GPA. Their procurement policies lack transparency, they lack consistency, and they have preferences for some of their domestic firms. But they also have no international procurement obligations. South Africa has a competitive procurement system, but it also has extensive preferences. And this was one of the issues we had when we were negotiating with SACU, which is the Southern African Customs Union. We were trying to do an FTA with them, which would have included South Africa. Those negotiations also didn't conclude. But one of the challenges there was how to handle their, particularly their black empowerment programs, which was just extensive preferences across the procurement regime. So the question was how to handle those in an FTA. But unfortunately, those negotiations didn't go forward. Okay, so you have U.S. policy on BRICS and the GPA. So the U.S. sort of has two approaches that it can use for getting a country to join the GPA. One is, as I mentioned earlier, seek the commitment when they join the WTO, as we did with China and Russia. That's not an option for Brazil. The second is to negotiate a free trade agreement. The U.S. has tried that with Brazil, and it has not been successful as part of the FTAA negotiations. So I think the U.S. at this point is encouraging Brazil to join the GPA, but it doesn't have any leverage. And that's always the issue, is what do you have to offer another country to say, join the GPA? Now, what the U.S. has in law is the Trade Agreements Act, which has a purchasing prohibition, which says basically that the federal government cannot buy goods or services from Brazil or any other non-GPA or FTA country until they open up their market under an agreement with the U.S. Now, so that means that Brazil is basically shut out of most of the procurement of the federal government, at least below the threshold that's set in the GPA. But I think the point seems to be that that's not enough of an incentive for Brazil to say, oh, we want into the U.S. market so much that we're willing to negotiate to join the GPA or find some other way to negotiate an agreement with the U.S. So it becomes a question of leverage. And I think at some point, if Brazil joins the EU in an FTA, that would probably lead it to join the GPA because they'd have to take on procurement obligations with the EU, and then that would be easier for them to join the GPA. Once a country opens up its procurement under an agreement with one set of countries, it's always easier to take the next step to open it up to a broader 
array of countries. Um, I think I'm just trying. No, it's so, not for you. What? <laughs> no, it's not forward for you. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Chris, Chris, thanks a lot for having me. Uh, my name is Johannes. I'm actually from Austria, but had the privilege of existing in actually a couple of countries in uh, negotiating accession to the GPA, and most recently, as it was pointed out, Montenegro, who actually managed to join the GPA in less than a year. And what I would like to do is to talk a little bit about my experience and about challenges, uh, challenges for uh, GPA exceeding nations. So the clip goes. It was already pointed out uh, by Gene and by Rob Anderson. Actually, I think there are many, many advantages to join the GPA. Honestly, I do not see any disadvantage in joining the GPA. We can be talking about market access, 1.7 trillion a year. Gene mentioned that the Brazilian companies do not have access to procurement markets here in the federal, uh, in the state, uh, in the United States federal level. But also, many, many European countries do not al allow companies from a non-GPA country to participate in uh, public procurement procedures. What is also important to know that coverage will expand signific significantly in the near future. Uh, Ukraine will be joining, uh, Russia will start negotiating, and China sooner or later will be joining the GPA. So I think this is also a very, very important argument. What I also see when I'm advising countries in Central and Eastern Europe, they have been doing a lot of reform work. So they have been starting with uh, reforming their public procurement legislation, and somehow joining the GPA is like a stamp of approval. Yes, I did my job, and now my national legislation complies with international best practice. And what I know that Brazil has an amazing uh, national public procurement system, uh, e-procurement very, very uh, far, actually. So I think this would also be an, an, an uh, important point. What a country has to do when it wants to join the GPA, basically it's very simple. simple. There are two conditions. <laughs> The first one is to prove that national legislation meets GPA basic requirements. So that's actually something very, very easy. And the second one, Brazil or all or big countries, every country who wants to accede to the GPA has to negotiate the coverage offer. What is important to note is that conformity of national public procurement legislation with the GPA, you can't negotiate this. So this is very, very important. So if you want to join the GPA, you have to convince all other GPA parties that your national legislation is in compliance with GPA principles. How is this actually done? I will then get back uh, in, in practice. Uh, actually, you have to explain to the other GPA countries how your public procurement system works. But what is interesting to note, uh, so the last country who joined the GPA was Montenegro, we just referred to an independent review of the European Union. So we did not have any single question when negotiating accession. The second one is you have to negotiate coverage, and then I get back here. The most important thing is actually you need the political will of your government. If there's no political will, uh, it's, you can't join, join the GPA. Other examples, and I know you can't compare Armenia or Montenegro with Brazil, the common con economies are completely uh, different. But if there is political will, it's actually quite easy to join the GPA. And why is it actually quite easy? Because basically you can negotiate everything. So this is the general rule. You can negotiate which procurements will be covered, you can also uh, negotiate which um, uh, uh, entities will be covered. The only thing is there are, of course, certain expectations of GPA parties. So if you start negotiating, there are basic monetary thresholds. You have to cover also your sub-central level. You will be asked to cover state-owned enterprises and utility companies. And basically, um, you cannot have many exceptions to coverage in your offer. But what's very important, and Rob Anderson pointed it out, so we have a new revised GPA which entered into force a couple of months ago, actually in April, and this new revised text gives you a lot of flexibilities. You can 
negotiate transition periods, you're allowed to negotiate offsets, price preferences, I think something very important for Brazil. Uh, you can actually start with higher thresholds or you can face in entities. So actually, what I just wanted to say with this, GPA membership has many, many advantages. It gives you a great deal of flexibility. So in my view, actually, I think it's important to get the ball rolling, to go to Geneva and to start negotiating. So there are two options, what Professor Yukins mentioned and also Gene Korea. You could become a, an observer, and I think it's, it's great to become an observer. There are no obligations. You can ask the WTO Secretariat to do technical assistance trainings in Brazil. It's great. But another option would be actually to start negotiating because you will be submitting an initial offer, a revised offer, and it's not binding. So in my view, I think it's important to get the ball rolling. And also, as this was stated uh, earlier, accession to the GPA will not get easier. I think this is something very important. Every country who wants to join the GPA actually has to convince all current GPA parties. So if there's one country saying, no, you won't join the GPA. It was mentioned there are some countries who will be joining the GPA soon. We know also, besides market access, there are always political issues. So again, I think uh, it's important to get the ball rolling. So consider to go to Geneva and start negotiating accession to the GPA. Thank you. Good morning. Um, first of all, I thank uh, Chris uh, for the uh, invitation to, to be here. It's uh, really an honor, a privilege. Uh, and I, when, when Chris uh, came to Brazil in August, uh, we had this uh, seminar in Brasilia, and he showed us a picture of uh, several different law research centers all over the world dealing with uh, international comparative public procurement, and there was none in Brazil. And I hope this, uh, this seminar here is a start uh, for us to fix that and, uh, and possibly have some type of uh, more permanent uh, exchange in, in, this, in this area. Uh, I, well, since we don't have much time, I will uh, jump really right into the... Okay. Yeah. Um, um, into, into the topic here. In, in, in Brasilia also, uh, Chris mentioned that uh, the uh, U.S. public procurement market uh, could be viewed as a walled garden. And uh, as, you, as I hope you'll see from my presentation and, and, and Mauricio's, uh, Brazil's could be maybe uh, uh, seen as an open garden with some traps in it and, in, and also some fences uh, that protect uh, a, a few areas. Uh, yeah, in, in theory, it, it's very open, uh, but uh, in practice, there are a lot of uh, difficulties. I will give you a very, very brief uh, outline of what, the, uh, uh, what, what our public procurement legislation is. Uh, we basically have one general law uh, of uh, 1993 uh, that is uh, built uh, around uh, probably international standards, uh, 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 transparency, uh, uh, qualification uh, requirements, uh, equal access to public uh, contracts, and it's and it's basic. It basically works around uh, the idea of a sealed competitive bid. That's the standard method under that legislation. Uh, of course, that became outdated, and uh, in the early uh, 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 around 2000, 2001. Uh, we enacted a new legislation creating a reverse auction. And immediately after that, we created the electronic reverse auction. Uh, this electronic reverse auction, as Robert has pointed out, has become the most important uh, method of procurement in Brazil. It, it, it amounts to 60% of uh, federal government expenditure. And uh, that, that, that's uh, considering 2013 uh, data. 
just for you to have an idea, uh, uh, the sealed, uh, uh, sealed competitive bidding uh, 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 amounts to uh, possibly 5% of, exp of, of, of government, government's expenditure. So there is a huge difference. Um, also, uh, basically all government purchases of goods and in, in, in services, um, or at least some services, must be done through a framework agreement. And so uh, this combination of framework agreements and uh, e-procurement, uh, basically electronic reverse auctions, uh, uh, is basically what, uh, what the uh, general practice in public procurement in Brazil is. More recently, in 2011, we have enacted some legislation that we call RDC, which is a Portuguese acronym. It, and that legislation was supposed to be uh, applied to World Cup in Olympics uh, 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 contracts because of, well, of course, we, we were a little behind schedule and so we had to expedite things. And we created this uh, more flexible and faster legislation. Uh, that became quite a success. It's much more, as, as I said, flexible and easier to apply than the, uh, than the old 1993 law. And uh, that, uh, that, that is now being uh, used as a model for a legislative reform. So uh, we are in the process of possibly adopting this more flexible uh, uh, legislation to all our uh, public procurement, or most of our public procurement. Uh, it's also important to point out that uh, we, we do have some specific coverage issues. Uh, some state-owned co uh, companies uh, are, are under uh, a different set of rules. Uh, that's, that's actually difficult to understand within our system. Uh, there, are, there, are, there is a lot of, uh, of, 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 of legal discussion about that, uh, but that's, that's what happens. Petrobras is one big example. They have a different law. Uh, even though our system is completely different from the U.S. system, uh, our our, uh, our public procurement regulation is all statutory. It's not based on, on, on secondary legislation. But, but, but even under that premise, Petrobras, since it's such a, a, a huge corporation, has been able to get away with this and have this uh, own uh, regulation uh, based on an executive uh, order. We, we have, and I, and I will deal with, the, with this later, we have, um, uh, as, as Jean has mentioned, uh, a set of preferences for domestic production and domestic technology. And we also have a set of preferences for uh, uh, small and medium-sized uh, enterprises. And uh, uh, as Mauricio will deal with this uh, in more detail, uh, we have separate legislation for PPPs and, and concessions in terms of procurement. Uh, now, uh, dealing with Brazil and the GPA, uh, I, I have made a, a list of some positive aspects and some possible difficulties. And uh, one, one positive aspect is that we do have legislation that's very much compatible with the GPA. There are very few things that could be changed easy things to change. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, language. We, we, would, we, would, we would have to do something that we don't do, uh, which is uh, uh, have uh, 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 all that information accessible in a WTO official language. But that, those are easy things to do. We also have one advantage, which is a concentration of legislation at the federal level. Even though Brazil is a federal, state, a federal uh, nation, uh, the uh, local and state legislation is, is really irrelevant. Uh, 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 all, all important legislation is done at federal level, which makes it easier also for these adjustments. Uh, we do have, uh, right now, a growing international, internationalization of Brazilian companies. Uh, some of them are already here, but it, uh, due to all these uh, difficulties not being, a part, uh, not being a party to the GPA, they have set up plants here which doesn't make, doesn't make sense. Uh, uh, we, uh, that's one, one argument in favor of GPA. We could have those jobs back in Brazil. Uh, uh, it, uh, it, but, the, but, but one positive aspect is precisely that they 
these companies are already thinking about that. Um, we, we do have a large uh, public procurement market. Uh, if we think about these international standards of 15 to 20% of the GNP, uh, that amounts to 250 to 300 billion US dollars. Uh, and, and there is, uh, 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 there has to be international attention to the size of Brazilian uh, market. And, uh, and as, uh, as Johan, Johannes has uh, mentioned, uh, we, we are really in some type of uh, race with the other BRICS, and, uh, and we should pay attention to, to, that, to that as well. Now, uh, some difficulties. These are arguments that are, are generally either, or that, ha that have generally either been used by public officials uh, when dealing with the GPA, or uh, have been uh, uh, examined by scholars in, 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 uh, in writings about this, uh, this topic. First, uh, uh, it's mentioned that uh, Brazil, instead of focu focusing on the GPA, is focusing on Mercosur. And as Jean pointed out, we do have, we, we are a party to, uh, a, a, to a, 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 a government purchases agreement within the Mercosur, but that agreement has never been ratified. Uh, but it's important to notice that uh, Argentina, which is the second largest country within the Mercosur, is already an observer uh, to the GPA. Uh, uh, Brazil also says that it has an excessively intense agenda within the WTO, and, and, and it doesn't want to uh, shift the focus to the GPA because we're worried about other things. Uh, uh, that, that may be true, but uh, uh, that one thing doesn't really exclude the other. Uh, what, what really, I think, is, uh, is the problem are these two last topics here. First, uh, uh, Brazil, the Brazilian government has become more and more aware of government procurement as a policy tool. And all those things of, of promoting small businesses, uh, promoting green procurement, um, uh, and, and, and mainly promoting local industry. We are having in Brazil, as you may know, a, a severe process of deindustrialization. Uh, the, uh, the industrial sector in Brazil uh, today is, is half the size of what it used to be a few <coughs> years ago. And it, it, in, 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 the, in the in local industry sees these domestic preferences, even though they, are, they, 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 they haven't really been used that much yet, uh, sees the, those domestic preferences as, a, as an important initiative by the government in favor of local industry. And, and, and finally, uh, I, there is, uh, there is uh, insecurity uh, within Brazilian companies about the actual access that they would get to international markets, which leads to uh, a relatively lack of pressure uh, from the private sector on the government to adopt initiatives to join. Now, moving uh, on to um, SME preferences. Uh, first of all, well, uh, uh, we have our, our law that deals with that is called Law 123. That's the number of the law, which kind of uh, 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 is a, an illustration of the idea of small businesses. Uh, but uh, uh, Small business, uh, SMEs uh, uh, in Brazil, in public procurement, have uh, an economic relevance that is comparable to what they have in the U.S., uh, as I understand. Um, if between 2008 to, and 2014, uh, they, have, they have been responsible for between 21 and 30 percent of uh, federal uh, purchases. And so it's a, it's, a, it's a huge part of the market, and it's something difficult to, to overcome. Uh, the way uh, those preferences work are basically this. Uh, first of all, the, these companies are, are uh, uh, what we call micro and small companies. The, uh, the thresholds are those, $150,000 or uh, $1. million a year in gross income. Uh, they have uh, facilitated procedures some requirements they're, they're not, uh, 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 they, they don't have to fulfill. They, they have something like a right of first refusal if they are within a certain bracket from the best proposal. 
some small value contracts can only be uh, awarded to small uh, or medium enterprises. Um, they, uh, the, uh, the government can issue, can, can, can adopt a mandatory subcontracting in, uh, of SMEs in, in, in any type of contract. So they can, they can order the contractor to, uh, to, to, to uh, subcontract uh, SMEs to a certain level. And, and, and there is also a 25% quota in contracts that uh, refer to separable goods. So uh, uh, that's also something that the government is bound to do. Uh, now, uh, the other type of preference that we have, which uh, can also be uh, a, a complication in joining the GPA, are the binational preferences. Those were created in 2010. We had for a long time um, a, a, a very, even though with some traps, as I mentioned at the beginning, we, uh, we, have, we had had uh, formally uh, equal treatment in, in, a, in, in, in almost uh, a prejudice against preferences to Brazilian companies, ever, 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 uh, 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 starting in the mid-1990s. That ended in 2010, and it, and it has become something that the um, um, uh, private sector uh, asks the government very intensely to, uh, to obtain those preferences. So far, there, uh, the way this works is the government can give uh, a margin of preference of up to 25%. That margin of preference is, is uh, calculated uh, based on a, on, a, on, a, on a technical assessment. And, and it's then uh, made official by means of uh, a presidential executive order. Uh, there, there, are, there, there were, in August this year, there were around 19 or 20 of those uh, orders. And, uh, and the, the amount, in, uh, the dollar amount of, of, of those preferences is not really that relevant yet. Uh, in 2012, uh, uh, out of about 90 billion uh, reais in purchases, there were 2.5 billion only that were affected by these preferences. And so it's... It, 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 it may be more of a theoretical problem uh, at this moment. Uh, but we also have some other domestic preferences that are not in that legislation. And w the most important of them uh, are the, the requirements for local content in uh, oil and gas, uh, 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 in the oil and gas sector. And that, it, that is crucial for the local industry. And it's very difficult to overcome. There, there, are, there are lots of fights over this local content uh, issue. Uh, there, there, in, there are also some domestic preferences like that in the defense and the IT sectors. Uh, the defense sector is, uh, has, a, has, a, has, a, has, a, has a specific law that creates uh, a great deal of, of uh, local preference. Uh, consistently with what I said in the beginning about our our uh, willingness to favor the Mercosur, the same legislation that deals with domestic preferences expressly mentions Mercosur countries as being uh, favored by that le legislation, pending only the ratification of that agreement. So it doesn't say uh, uh, any, any uh, international agreement. It, it mentions specifically the Mercosur <coughs> agreement as if that were uh, the only one that we would ever be uh, a party to. So uh, uh, to end, I, uh, to conclude this, I, I would just mention that uh, as, as the bright side, we do have relatively easy uh, harmonization, uh, harmonization effort. We have a well-established, a mature public procurement system. We, we have a great deal of transparency. Uh, all, the, all, the, all this information is uh, available on, on, a, on, a, on a government uh, website uh, in, in in, in, uh, and all the legislation is built around the idea of, tra of transparency. We have the centralization of decision making in public procurement. Um, we may have uh, at this moment still a possible uh, favorable environment for negotiation uh, since uh, some of the, the other BRICs are not party to the GPA yet. But we do have, on the other hand, a widespread use of protectionist mechanisms. We have this increased awareness 
by public officials that uh, uh, public procurement is an instrument for public policy, and, and, and it's hard to imagine that they will give that up, give that up this, uh, the, the freedom to use that. And we still have a lack of awareness uh, by Brazilian companies of the benefits uh, of, the GP, of joining the GPA, which leads to this lack of, um, of pressure from the private sector uh, on the government to do something about it. Well, thank you very much for your attention. specialist in, in PPPs. Actually, I can say that I'm especially in private participation in infrastructure in Brazil. Um, I maybe um, um, in US, uh, the US, the, the environment, the, the, the private participation in infrastructure is very different from Brazil. Uh, just to, maybe we should start with, with uh, trying to make the technology clear. When I say private participation infrastructure, I mean uh, the, 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 the situations in which the government hire uh, a private company that will invest in, construct, or upgrade an infrastructure, and this uh, private company will uh, uh, amortize its investment through uh, getting uh, revenues from tariffs from the users of the infrastructure or from government payments. So. This is the kind of, of arrangement, this is the kind of deal in which I have been working for the last uh, 15 years. Uh, I'm not really sure whether this is something that it's obvious for everybody, but Brazil have done one of the most successful private participation programs in infrastructure in the world. Uh, uh, if you, uh, you can measure the size of a, a private participation program through looking at the revenues that the government have get, have, have, have got through the, uh, uh, through the selling of, 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 of business and uh, through the awards uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of concessions, of concessions of, of, of infrastructure. Uh, you can measure through the, the, the investment that you generate in the service, in the infrastructure service, and you can measure through the uh, variety of sectors in which private participation was involved in infrastructure. In any of these sectors, uh, Brazil is probably uh, between the second or the third uh, country in the world in terms of the size of, it, of its uh, private participation program in infrastructure. Uh, so uh, when uh, CESA and Chris uh, invited me here, I, was, I keep thinking uh, what would be the relationship between you know, Brazilians' private participation program in infrastructure and in GPA. Uh, especially uh, because, as Cesar said, uh, uh, Brazil, in, for the big projects, for the big infrastructure projects, Brazil has always been uh, an open garden, completely open garden. Uh, if you uh, want to uh, participate in, in, if a big American company wants to participate in a big infrastructure project in Brazil, it, it won't have, uh, if you look at the law, uh, it would be really easier for it to participate in, the, in this, in this bidding. But then, as, as Cesar said, there are some fences and traps that are sort of hidden there. Uh, and, I, and I would guess that in other countries you will find, you know, although the law says that there is no, uh, no discrimination, there is equal treatment, you also find in these traps. So uh, I, I just want today to use my experience to uh, point out two little traps, okay, uh, that you can find. It's very important traps you'll see. Um, uh, let me go directly, as we have only 10 minutes, uh, let me go directly to, to two traps which you, you can find in Brazil, in some, some projects. Uh, and I wonder whether you can find it also in other, in other countries. 
Uh, and the only way to, to get to know these traps is to, you know, to talk with companies that have tried to participate in bidding in these specific countries. Uh, in the case, for instance, when you are doing a, a bidding for, for a big infrastructure project, you have to check uh, in the qualification process uh, in the bidding procedure, you have to check whether these companies or these consortiums of companies uh, have the capacity to invest, to do a big investment in infrastructure. So one way of checking the, the, the financial health of the, of the company is using uh, uh, debt ratios, liquidity ratios, solvency ratios. Uh, the problem is uh, these ratios are very sensitive to the economic and financial environment in which each company operates. So uh, if you can imagine that as Brazil has this history until the 90s of inflation, even today uh, companies in Brazil has the, a relation between debt to equity that are really lower than the one that you find for an instance in US, even in this, in this period of crisis, of post crisis. Uh, or in, in Europe. So depending on what is the debt ratio that you, that, you, that you ask in your terms of reference as a condition for the qualification in the, in the bidding procedure, uh, American companies, international companies, uh, European companies wouldn't be able to participate in a bidding in Brazil, although many of the Brazilian companies would be able to participate. Okay? So this is, uh, I'm not saying that this is something that is used to, uh, as a barrier. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that when we uh, look and, and we try to analyze uh, equal treatment, this is the kind of detail that is very important, and you won't see it as a general provision in the law. So you have to go there and look at each tendering a document in order to see whether this kind of trap is there. There's another one, which is... Um, may not be so, so obvious as the, the first one, uh, that are related to the technical qualifications uh, that you have to, uh, to bring in order to, to qualify uh, in, a, in, a, in a bidding procedure for a big infrastructure project. Generally, uh, there is a requirement to show certificates of construction, experiencing construction of, of uh, infrastructures that are uh, uh, in the same kind of, in the same size, in the same kind of, in the same kind of infrastructure. Uh, so, in order to, for these certificates to be valid in the bidding procedure, in each country you have very specific rules on that. Okay, in the case of Brazil, you have to uh, register the international certificate uh, in the in the engineers regional council what we call, in, in Portuguese, we call CREA, Conselho Regional de Engenharia. Um, uh, so, um, for you to validate your certificate of, for an instance, a big public work done in the U.S. or uh, a railroad that you operate somewhere in Europe, uh, it takes some time. And, and many times, uh, the, the time that you need to validate your certificate are not compatible with the, 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 the deadlines that you have to follow in order to submit your proposal. So um, it requires, I would say, a lot of preparation, <laughs> a lot of uh, time invested uh, to really participate effectively in a BD procedure in, uh, in Brazil. And I, and I would guess that it, this, this is the same thing for companies from Brazil that wants to go to Europe and to other countries, you'll find uh, some, some, I would say, hidden traps that are in the system that in, in, in you have, a, in, you only can map, actually, asking the companies that have this experience. Uh, I just wanted to bring a case to you. There is a Spanish company called OHL. It's a medium to big size construction company in in Spain, uh, and it had a lot of concessions, uh, road concessions in Spain. Uh, it tried for some years uh, to get, uh, to, to, to participate in bidding procedures in Brazil of road concessions. 
uh, they were not very su successful in participating of the bids. Uh, they actually had to buy some concessions in the secondary market. They did this in 2002. Uh, as, as you can imagine, in 2002, when Lula uh, started to, to raise in the pools, all the concessions became really cheap because everybody was were expected to, uh, Lula to nationalize everything, right? Um, and so they bought some, some concessions in 2002, and then they were able to participate successfully in a, in a, road, uh, in a round of road concessions in 2007. So this is just to, to, to end my, my participation here in the, in the same. I, I, my point is just that you have to, in order to, to understand what, are, uh, what is equal treatment and no discriminatory treatment, you have really to go into the details, especially in big infrastructure projects, I would say that you have to go to the tendering documents and have technical eye and have a technical capacity to understand really where are the, the, the little uh, barriers, the little obstacles to, uh, to really participate. And this would be a challenge, I think, in, 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 uh, in trying to bring everybody to, to the GPA <laughs> to the, the GPA standard, I think that this will be a permanent challenge to find where are the traps in the different countries. Thank you very much. So we're going to open the floor to questions now. I have a number of questions for our panelists, but um, I want to give the audience member, if you, the audience members a chance to, to ask any if you want to ask a question. Yeah, I have a, a two-part question, I guess, uh, Mr. Schnitzer, if you have the best one. Best one. Um, so from the perspective of someone who's studied GPA accession process but knows nothing about it from a practical standpoint, what's actually happening, um, can you explain first when you're looking at a, a, a country's you know, procedural system, does it match up? Is it a check-the-box process, or are you looking into, um, let's say, what Mr. Riviera discussed, you know, whether or not the, the RFPs themselves contain like, de facto ways of excluding companies that you wouldn't really know unless you looked at it. And then the second part, when it comes to the negotiations, the, the coverage, does the way it worked, does the, does the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the country seeking a session <coughs> with their initial offer and then it's, it's, it's broadened, or is it uh, the, the current GPA members come with what they expect and then it's scaled back? And then what does that actually look like in practice in our kind of interim offers looked at and say, you know what, that's not going to work, go back and look at it before you present, I mean, how does that kind of work? Thank you, huh? two, two good questions. So the first one is actually the GPA requires that both the legislation and practice meets GPA requirements. So this is what the law says. Honestly, my experience, when you go to Geneva and you start negotiating, you need to prove that your laws are actually in compliance with GPA requirements. Uh, in the case of Montenegro, I mentioned it, uh, we just referred to a third party paper, in this case the European Union, uh, a very important one, but Montenegro did not get any single question. So actually, also, I think this is also true, in many EU countries you still have all these obstacles that, I don't know, a concrete tender procedure is somehow and indirectly discriminating. Then of course, but then you have your big protest system. But so the first question is more, you, you, it depends what GPA parties will ask for, but normally first resort is always actually uh, the law, not the practice. Okay, just, sorry, just to jump from there, I guess what I was, what, the part I was wondering the most about was you know, the, the challenge procedures where a country says, oh sure, we have it, but then you look at the statistics and you find out you know, it's, it's used like very rarely, or when it is used, it's decided in a day and the decisions are two sentences long. What, what, what does that look like? So actually, the GPA requires for, active, for an effective remedy system, and it must be timely, and so there's some basic procedures. This is a different topic, but a very important question. We could talk it with Professor Jukins. Is the GPA actually enforceable or not? Okay. <laughs> so very, very hot topic. There are views of some GPA countries that actually it's not enforceable, but very important, but may, may, maybe not today. <laughs> I'm going to have a heart attack. 
The second question was, sorry. Just about the, the, the exactly, exactly. association process. It, it depends. So actually, it depends. Montenegro came forward with a very clean offer because their national law actually does not discriminate against foreign competition. So they said, we are, we are already giving away everything. So for them, it was very easy. It's a negotiating decision, actually, how you would like to, to structure your, your process. Many, many countries use the approach, they start with a low offer, and then they just look and wait what the other GPI parties are asking for. So it depends. Montenegro, and again, you can't compare Montenegro to Brazil, so it's a very, very tiny country. But for them, the right decision was clean offer. It's actually the initial offer was more or less the final offer. There were some technical issues. But that's it. But other countries like uh, China used uh, the approach of the first offer, and this is not what I'm saying, was considered a choke offer. All other cheap A parts said this is a choke. And now it's number number seven. So it depends on your on your on your strategy. Just let me add on that last point because on the negotiating the the, uh, the negotiating country has to put an initial offer down. That's part of the requirement. And then how the parties handle it depends upon the country. In the case of China, as I mentioned, they've now put in five offers, one initial and four revised. And in most cases, after their initial their offer, the U.S., the EU, and some of the other countries will put in what they call formal requests for improvements <coughs> and say and detailed say, here's what we want you to improve. Um, and then you know the, the seating country comes back and ignores it or maybe makes some adjustments. And that goes back and forth. Um, I think in the case of China, there's there was an, a, a, several parties had put in big requests about maybe two or three years ago, and since then have been simply writing on them saying, China, you know what we want, and we haven't fulfilled. So it's it's a back and forth. And I think with some countries it's much easier than others. You know, back to the um, conformity of the, of, of the uh, GPA. When Armenia joined two, three years ago, uh, the GPA parties looked closely at their law and said it doesn't comply here, here, and here, and then required them to make changes in that law before they were allowed to, or before they were approved for accession. And the, and the <coughs> committee actually made sure they could look at the law and see that it had been changed. Um, but obviously there may be provisions in terms of how it's implemented, that's a whole different issue. Five more seconds. For instance, Moldova, they are currently negotiating a session. Their coverage offer is more or less done, so GPA parties are happy. But their law is not yet in compliance with GPA principles. So they circulated a draft of the law, I think, one month ago, or a couple of weeks ago. And now GPA parties are looking and checking the law whether or not it's GPA compliant or not. Yeah, I would just like to add something uh, about protests and, and challenges. Uh, Brazil has a very uh, detailed and effective system of protests uh, at agency level and then at a level that's similar to the G, G, GAO. Um, and, and so if that can be uh, defense against these uh, obstacles and traps and uh, barriers, uh, we, we do have that defense. And so we, uh, we would be able to show that we have uh, means for inter international or domestic companies to challenge these uh, 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 fitting process provisions that they would consider to be uh, discriminatory. Mm -hmm. I have a question from Professor Spinner. So I think the question is mostly for our colleagues and myself, but I'm willing to hear from anybody. So, you know, from what I said, I agree as a premise with Johannes' point earlier that I think that the GPA in many ways it looks like a gimmick, okay? And I don't want to speak for Gina, I don't want to speak for Rob, but I guess I'm intrigued historically by Brazil's apparent lack of interest. So I realize that India and China are very different stories. As you indicate, Brazil has this incredibly sophisticated public procurement regime and I think that a session would be quite easy. So if someone who travels a lot, I fly Brazilian regional jets all the time. They've basically taken over the market in any aircraft of 100 seats or less. The pilots love them, the airlines love them. So it seems to me, wouldn't you want access to these markets around the world that are GPA members? Which leads me to conclude that maybe we're missing something obvious. Maybe the commercial marketplace is sufficiently attractive. Maybe the BRICS marketplace is sufficiently attractive. Or maybe the government procurement geeks are deluding ourselves in thinking that the government contracts market is that attractive a deal. So, but I'm just kind of curious, do you have any theories as to, you know, as an outsider, it just seems bizarre that Brazil wouldn't just waltz it into a new I don't get it. Okay.
Okay. I will I'll try to answer uh, from, from the experience that I have, which is with big infrastructure companies in Brazil. Especially in the last years, in the last five years, I have been working a lot in the transport sector, uh, roads, railroads, uh, uh, and metro projects. Uh, what I can tell you at this point uh, is that uh, most uh, big Brazilian companies have no capacity, no uh, spare capacity uh, to go outside Brazil and invest in projects. They are, their portfolio are full. Uh, the government are saying that, uh, uh, in, for instance, Dilma was doing last year, she was trying to structure a new program of uh, concessions of concessions and PPPs of greenfield railroads. Uh, and they announced that uh, uh, they wanted to do about $45 billion of investment in the next six years uh, uh, with the, this program. Uh, and you look around to the, to the infrastructure companies, everybody you know, wants to participate, everybody wants to be involved in, but to look at the balance sheets, uh, and you don't see really capacity to do that. You have to have, you have to change the way that you finance private companies in Brazil in order to allow them to, to be able to do this kind of investment in the next year. So uh, this is um, especially, uh, I'll say, uh, this is a special uh, problem right now if you, if you think, and if you remember that at this point no uh, American or European infrastructure companies is, is, is thinking about investing in Brazil because of the changes that uh, were, were made in the last years, because of the problems with the, our economic policy, because of the way they evaluate the regulatory risk. So, so I, I I'll say that at, at this point, Brazilian companies are so busy with, with Brazil that I don't think that they would you know, look for <laughs> Uh, other opportunities, look for opportunities outside the country. Th this would be my explanation from, from the standpoint that I can, for the things that I can see. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree with that. And, um, and, and basically, what happens is that uh, Brazilian companies know how to operate in that market. They are, as Moisés said, happy with the size of the market so far. And, and, they, and so they don't really have any incentive to make it easier for international companies to get, go into Brazil in exchange for something that they don't really feel that they need at this moment. Uh, and, and also, uh, some Brazilian companies like Embraer or, or Odebrecht that I mentioned, uh, 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 they, what they do is they uh, structure their business in a way that they, they are able to benefit from the GPA or from, from uh, other uh, agreements uh, without Brazil having to join. And so that's how they, uh, they come here and they operate from here, or, for instance. Uh, and that, that, that's actually something similar to what happens with exit, with investment arbitration. Uh, uh, I, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but uh, Brazil had a problem with Bolivia a few years ago. Uh, a, a refinery was nationalized. Uh, however, Brazil, uh, finally they, they settled, but uh, Brazil would have been able to use investment arbitration in that case because it had, be, it had made that investment through a Dutch vehicle. And so it benefited from uh, an agreement that Brazil is not a party to. Just um, add one point on that. I think once a country opens their, G their uh, market in the GPA, they don't restrict it just to GPA parties. The only exception is the U.S. with the trade agreements law. Otherwise, if you're, you know, once the EU's, the EU market is essentially open, except for sort of hidden things that you can't necessarily see. So I think there's, there's never that lack of incentive, because once you, you know, if you can get access, if you want access, you may not want access, but if they're a GPA party, you can gain it, access without having to open up your own market. You mentioned the lack of incentives. When it comes to China and India, like iPhones are made in China. If there are government agencies to use them. And all, almost all of the computer monitors, keyboards, and mice are made in China. We still have it on our office. Most of the, uh, a lot of IT help desk services and programming are being done in India by Indian companies under government contracts. So the, my question is that if 
these countries are sending their services and products under the current regime without getting into GPA under the government procurement. And I think the reason being is somewhat of a technical reason that USTR hasn't been really looked into the implementation into the all process of the regulation, regulation, which has some barriers in terms of it's not clear as to the country of origin for services in the regulation. We talked about it a while ago, it's like 10 years ago. And also, under current government procurement, we do a lot of things under IDIQs, independent delivery contracts, under which orders are the real ones that, you know, that trigger the acquisition. But the question is that whether the threshold of the TAA applies at the order level or the IDIQ umbrella contract level. So there's a lot of technical unclarity. And it seems to me that USTA is sort of ignoring all these things while lamenting about the fact that other big countries are not interested in getting enough pressure to join GPA. I mean, when I was in government, that was always a question. There was all this stuff on my desk that was from China. And the question is, how does that happen? I mean, USTR is clearly not the enforcer. But I think there's, and as you said, there's some technical reasons. I think if it's just on the IDIQ, the indefinite quantity, indefinite, those are always covered. Because you have to assume there's unlimited, you don't know what the amount's going to be. So if you don't know the amount, then it's a covered procurement. So when you put those contracts out, then they have to be considered only, anything you buy under that should be GPA compliant, regardless of the actual size of the order. But my sense has been in talking a lot to different government agencies, agencies would find clever ways to get around the purchasing prohibition. They would either buy something less than the threshold, you know, because the threshold is, now it's about 200,000, I think. So they'd find a way to get, to work around that, keep the contract low. Or they would do it through other programs. I think maybe from a small business, the small business is selling to the government, they don't necessarily have to comply with the purchasing requirement. So there's lots of ways for them to get around it. But I think the bottom line with China is, you know, China's concern is more defensive and not offensive. So, I mean, because as you said, they're selling a lot here anyway. India, the services is a big issue, because as you said, in the FAR, there's one line that says, I think services, the country of origin of services is where the company's established. My understanding from some agencies is they apply something else. And so that's not been something that's ever been very defined. So, you know, there's a lot of U.S. purchases of countries, from countries that are not GPA parties or FTA parties. Can I add a couple of points from Geneva? Sure. So I would just, so I'm still reflecting on Professor Schooner's question, which to me is quite a pertinent one. And I certainly don't know all the answers to it. I think it's possible that in many countries, suppliers simply are not aware of the extent of commercial opportunities that are available, potentially, in the procurement area and under the GPA. And this is something that we're actually trying in Geneva. Amazingly enough, perhaps, we have an e-electronic tool under development. We're going to call it the e-GPA system, which is going to make much more easily accessible to commercial suppliers, as well as to governments internationally, the simple extent of procurement opportunities that are out there, whether it's in the United States or the EU or Canada or Japan or whatever. This is one thing I think we need to work on. The other thing I want to point to is the advantages of coming into the agreement earlier rather than later. Because what I mean by that is that when a country joins the GPA, then it will have a say in the eventual terms of accession of all other countries that come into the GPA after it does. So this means, for example, now because Montenegro and New Zealand have concluded their accessions last week, they will have a say in the eventual terms of accession of China and of Russia. And anyone who comes in before China and Russia complete their processes 
will also have a say in, in bargaining for the terms of accession of those two countries. Also, also India. So, so anyway, it's a complex calculus, and uh, I, I fully accept that countries all have defensive and offensive interests, commercial interests that they have to look at. But um, I think there's a lot here that's worth looking at, and that's all I want to say. Thank you, Rob. I think we have time for one more question from Dan Gordon. I'd like to tell you a quick, um, a quick anecdote, perhaps a reaction. I'm curious to hear. Uh, just a week ago today, I was in uh, Paraguay, Asuncion, for the Inter-American uh, Procurement Network's 10th Annual Conference, uh, where Brazilian government officials were among the lead speakers. Uh, as I listened to people from across the region, both Latin America and the Caribbean, talk about procurement, I was struck, based on our experiences here at GW, uh, speaking around the world, about good news and bad news. The good news was that in Latin America and the Caribbean, much like we've heard across the world, we've got my, uh, my neighbor here, Lauren Ziegler, is from the U.S. Trade and Development Agency. We were together in Vietnam, for example, earlier this year. We were together in Botswana for a week of training. <coughs> The good news is, in Latin America, I think the message about how important public procurement is has gotten through. Heightened awareness about how important public procurement is. The bad news is, and I'm particularly sensitive to what I was hearing about recent legislation under the prior president, uh, the bad news is, unlike countries that we work with in the U.S. Trade Development Agency that are looking to get better value through public procurement, or looking to fight corruption through public procurement, or in general to improve uh, governance. What I heard last week at the conference, especially from the Brazilian government officials, was public procurement is the way to help our domestic, small and medium-sized enterprises. There was an entire Brazilian government presentation that was entitled Public Procurement at the Service of Brazilian SMEs. And it is a very different lesson. And if you think that that is um, being fair to them, it seems to me that Latin America, at least many of the Latin American countries, are moving in a somewhat different direction from what's going on in much of the rest of the world. Yeah, if I can uh, comment on that. Um, in 2010, when we enacted this uh, by national reference uh, legislation, uh, we made a, an important change to one provision in the Brazilian law that uh, deals with the principles of public procurement. And uh, up to then, uh, we, we had traditionally uh, indicated in our law that the principles, the purposes of public procurement were to get best value and equal access to the public contracting. And uh, we, we included a third purpose, which is the advancement of uh, sustainable national development, uh, which is like putting this big principle of, uh, of, 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 of protectionism in the law, into the law. Right? And in that principle, it works through these uh, domestic preferences and these uh, exclusive uh, uh, biddings and things like that. Uh, so yeah, yeah, it's true. Uh, the, the government has like, suddenly discovered that uh, public procurement is, uh, is, n is not a way to uh, get best value, but it's a way to interfere in the economy, uh, a way to, uh, for uh, a tool for intervention rather than uh, a, a, a means for better government expenditure only. Any questions? Wait, folks have to get off the class so when I close on time. Well, please join me in thanking our panel for one thing. Please feel free to, to meet with the individual members of the panel. Thank you. Good luck on finishing up the other questions. Thank you. 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 Having to go through this phase and having to go through this phase.